Sister Rebecca. Brother Chadi. Ah. Yes. Okay. Good evening. Okay, we'll we'll start now. Um, good evening to all our <clears throat> brothers and sisters here this evening. Once again, uh, this is our monthly uh, talk organized by the Theosophical Order of Service in the Philippines. Um, TOS is the service arm of the Theosophical Society, which was founded by Dr. Annie Besant in 1908. Since then, TOS has been actively implementing different projects in many different countries. In the Philippines, TOS has been implementing several programs for the upliftment of the less privileged members of our society. Tonight, in this talk, we have a dear sister with us who joined us all the way from London. Now I request Brother Charlie Romero, Chairman of TOS and the National President of the Theosophical Society to introduce our guest speaker, Brother Charlie. Thank you very much, Sister Rekha, and a pleasant evening to all. Uh, for TAPS, who is in London, I guess it's about uh, mid midday there. But it is my privilege and honor to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, none other than Taposhri Ganguli, also known as TAPS. She holds a doctorate degree in applied statistics and works at a management consultancy in London. Besides her day job as a statistician, which primarily requires her to build and explore human behavioral models, she feels an integral need to have a number or an equation for everything in life. Mostly consumed and fascinated by patterns all around, she finds a unique strength in the interrelated and connected net of emotions, thoughts, and actions. Taps was introduced to Theosophy on a long haul flight from London to San Francisco by a co-passenger. She left that conversation while disembarking, not knowing that a few years later, a series of incidents would lead her to the secret doctrine. Taps associates the secret doctrine to home, to a sense of belonging and a knowing that doesn't need words or numbers. It just is. At another level, she treats it as a thesis of Helena, Helena Petrona, Petrovna Blavatsky and finds it deeply fascinating to read and contemplate through it like an academic. So brothers and sisters, let us all welcome Taps with the intriguing topic, Human Augmentation, a Theosophical Perspective. Thank you. That was a very beautiful introduction. And thank you for all the generosity. And I am extremely, extremely grateful. A very good afternoon to everyone. And thank you once again from the bottom of my heart for the invite. It's an absolute honor to be able to share this space with each one of you today. So I'm just going to uh, share my slides so that I can begin talking with it. So in a broad sense, what I wish to share today has an impact on our education systems and in the training and engagement that we provide for the youth of today. I have called it human augmentation because I want to emphasize on some key learnings of these technological enhancements that might seem out of reach today, but it is going to be ready for the mass market in say about 20 years to 30 years time. So what is human augmentation? And before I begin, let me say, I'm not going to go on for a long time. So this is, I have kept it short. So um, I know it's, it's quite, it's evening time in Philippines. So I've kept it short. So let's start. So what is human augmentation? 
Human augmentation refers to the usage and application of science and technologies to improve human performance temporarily or permanently. Human performance is divided into two categories, human performance optimization and human performance enhancement. Now, I've picked three very uh, recent news articles. On 13th of May, 2021, the Ministry of Defense published a report, Human Augmentation, the Dawn of a New Paradigm Strategic Implications Project. On 12th of September, 2021, a stroke study reveals the future of human augmentation. This is a study based on a clinical trial where on stimulating the vagus nerve of a human body and how it could change everything from medical treatment to Olympic training. But the question that was asked here was, are we ready? And just about three days ago, on 6th of October, 2021, Human Augmentation Market Innovations, Trends, Technology and Applications Report was published from 2021 to 2027 that was released and published. Now, why is there so much of investment and so much of emphasis on this enhancement and augmentation of humans? And how does it work? I'm pretty sure you've all heard of it. So, or, or you are probably aware of it. So the human augmentation market is segmented below by technology and by device. By technology, it comes as part of wearables. You can have virtual reality, you have augmented reality, you have exoskeleton, you have intelligent virtual assistants. Now, some of the devices can be worn, which you can wear like Google lenses and glasses that you can wear to enhance your performances, enhance uh, your you know, whatever capabilities you probably are looking to enhance. And there are some that are non-body worn, like apps that you use for augmented reality, for example, where you kind of use your phone as a device to then um, interact or engage with a particular product in the market. Now, one example, which is one of my, uh, one ex this is a project that I'm following very closely out of personal interest is the Third Thumb Project, which is currently a part of an exciting new neuroscientific research in collaboration with the Plasticity Lab in the Institute of Cognitive Neurosciences at the University College London. The Third Thumb is a 3D printed thumb extension of your hand controlled by your feet. The project investigates the relationship between the body and prosthetic technology in new ways. It is part two, part experience and part research, a model by which we are better able to understand human response to artificial extensions, thus exploring human augmentation and aiming to reframe prosthetics as an extension of the body and by no means trying to replace it. And you can see in that lovely picture there how the thumb is also holding onto the cup, letting all your other fingers be free. Um, and this is a fascinating study. Now, while all these experiments are underway, Tesla and SpaceX founder Elon Musk, who I'm sure everybody has heard of, has stated his belief that people would need to become cyborgs in order to keep up with machines in the future. His technology, Neuralink, would implant tiny electrodes into the brain to give humans the ability to direct computing. Now, the question that I ask at this point is, what is the benefit of these enhancements? Is there a benefit for the whole of humanity? While there may be ways and methods available to each of us today to genetically modify the way we look, get a few inches of height, get that desired skin, etc., but do genetic modifications to look better necessarily translate into feeling better? Now, wiping off illnesses, also known as gene editing, has been seen in China. Known as CRISPR Cas9, the tech was created in 2012 to edit genes using enzymes with precision accuracy. In 2018, it was used to create the first genetically engineered babies their genes edited to remove HIV, leading to huge controversies on whether such procedures should or should not be allowed to carry out in the world. Now then, 
Before we wait to hear on the ethical buildup surrounding these tech and frameworks, let me go back to Musk and his belief on the need of people to become cyborgs. I have two of my absolute favorite cyborgs that I would like to share with you today. I'm pretty sure some of you might have heard of them, Neil Harbison and Moon Ribas. Neil, as you can see in the picture here, was born with an achromatic vision, meaning someone who cannot see colors. Neil has an antenna, which is now recognized as a part of his body. There was a huge controversy and a lot of back and forth with the passport office, not allowing him to use the antenna as a part of his body. He was asked to remove it, but finally it is now recognized as a part of his body. This antenna is used by his trusted sources to send him colors. This way, he's able to hear images and paint sounds. By the way, both Neil and Moon are artists, cyborg artists to be precise. Moon, on the other hand, moves to the seismic sim signals from transplanted sensors in her body. As a choreographer and within the medium of dance, movement is not limited or restricted to humans only. That's what Moon says. There are other agents that move and there are other ways of moving, moving and existing. She wanted to perceive these types of movement. And she felt that if she could enact herself as technology, she could reach a deeper experience. Moon further quoted, we think that we are alone on the planet, but we are not. Moon is known for developing and implanting online seismic sensors in her feet that allow her to feel the vibrations, feel the earthquake through the vibrations. So the dance that she's talking about and the movement that she does is based on the vibrations of the earth that she's able to feel. Moon and Neil co-founded the Cyborg Foundation in 2010. They started a collective in London called Cyborg Nest and will start to sell cybernetic implants that will allow you to choose an additional sense. But Moon is found to be saying, that the cyborg movement is all about getting closer to nature. She was also heard saying in an interview, and I quote, now that I'm a cyborg, I don't feel closer to machines. I actually feel closer to earth and to nature and animals. I can feel my planet every day. And I relate to animals because they can also feel this natural phenomena intensely. I think if we extended our senses to understand our planet better, then maybe our behavior towards it would also change. I'm going to pause now here to reflect. With technology pushing us to enhance our perceptions and experiences through artificial interventions, and with cyborgs coming back to tell us that they feel a closer connection to nature, to the planet, and believe for sure that we are not alone, this is us. As a collective community, are we coming back in full circle by reinventing the wheel? Now, while you may laugh at my question, I'll take you to the text of Theosophy and few other schools of thought, and then we'll go into science. In Theosophy, it is taught that human evolution is tied in with this planetary and wider cosmic evolution. According to the teachings, the purpose of human life is the spiritual emancipation of the soul. Theosophy also proposes the existence of planes higher or subtle than the physical one, and therefore the theosophical view of evolution includes a previous stage where the spiritual nature descends into physical, becoming denser and denser. You can very well say, I've never studied theosophy. I never studied the text. That's fine. Let's look at what is being said in another school of thought, which is in Buddhism. Indian Buddhist meditation models provide a philosophical and ethical framework for reflecting on the way in which Buddhist thought might engage with technologies of human augmentation. The Samatha Vipassana dialectic implies that the transformation human capacities, whether through meditation or technology, may make humans more like deities, but that such power is spiritually and morally ambiguous 
and ultimately temporary. Now, you may say, well, I don't really follow these schools of thought, but I follow science. What does science have to say? Let's look at what science has to say. And there's a lot on this slide, but we'll go over it slowly. So I'm sure at some point in your life or the other, each of us or all of you probably have felt that gut feeling or that inner voice. The science behind intuition or gut feeling suggests that, that this just might be the superpower that we all should be tapping into. Also, science loves experiments and something tangible to prove or disprove. Hence, the search for the God spot in the brain has been a long standing exercise and with a successful conclusion that it didn't exist. Now, because different areas of the brain light up when we use moral reasoning versus when we experience awe, for example. But what has remained clear is more than 80% of humans worldwide report being spiritual or religious. Interestingly, researchers have now used a method known as lesion network mapping to find the home of spirituality in the brain. In their study published in Biological Psychiatry, the researchers report that they have located a specific brain circuit for spirituality found in the periaqueductal uh, gray, which is also known as PHE. Now only time will tell if this finding holds true or not, but spirituality, which can be broadly defined as a sense of connection with something greater than the self is surely worth studying. Many of the components associated with spirituality, namely connection or empathy, altruism, compassion are also solidly associated with happiness in the research. In another study, neuroscientists explain how they generated personally relevant spiritual experiences in a diverse group of subjects and scanned their brains while these experiences were happening. The results indicate that there is a neurobiological home for spirituality. When we feel a sense of connection with something greater than the self, whether transcendence involves communion with God, nature, or humanity, a certain part of the brain appears to activate. Whether you use your own power, you listen to your inner voice, do your inner work, or take help of the technology, it's a completely personal choice. But the sense of connection to something greater than the self is where the emphasis has always been for humanity. And I feel that this is not going to change. Now, beyond mental health, scientists study spirituality because the human quest for meaning is timeless and universal. By cultivating spiritual experiences, in addition to strengthening our intellectual abilities, people can lead emotionally richer lives and develop more open minds now, I don't say it, the scientists say it. So even if you don't have to believe, don't want to believe me, don't believe me, but believe science for that matter. But now we come back to the world today and our agreed upon realities where technology is a part of all our lives. Smartphones to Roombas cleaning homes to Alexa answering our questions and playing our favorite music. We are in the high intense technology era. Can't deny that at all. Not that I want to, but can't deny that. Data scientists, including statisticians like me, work round the clock with billions of data points to analyze human behavior, behavior in different contexts. Some contexts are to sell you products, get you to engage better with the app or the organization or the company, or some just tap into your personal interests like politics, psychology, literature, art, so on and so forth. The deep fascination of power, the kind of power that translates into controlling and making masses engage in your thought process is alarming to say the least. To be certain, Jobs and Apple are not alone in creating this kind of a modern world view of technology. We have Netflix, Google, Facebook, and several other tech companies also leaving humanity sick, 
distracted and in a state of perpetual techno hypnosis. Now, we live and breathe also in an age of hybrid qualifications. Every single day, we come across people with more than one skill and they are proficient at both. We have MBA grads making films because they know and they can sell the product really well. At the same time, we have uh, science students and graduates turning into designers because that's what they feel is their inner calling. The time, perseverance, endurance, and effort that is required to study, analyze, and assimilate information, and more than that, to become and live by the teachings, or to even be able to critically appraise them, seems to be approaching a more holistic version than the one that I grew up in, I guess. Well, while we see all these examples all around us, the journey from data to information is way more critical than realized. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to come to that in a bit. But let's first look at knowledge and education. Now, what do these terms mean? Knowledge is a highly valued state in which a person is in cognitive contact with reality. It is therefore a relation. On one side of the relation is a conscious subject, and on the other side is a portion of reality to which the knower is directly or indirectly related. The knower's own mental states are often thought to be the most directly knowable portions of reality. Now, this is something as stated by Linda in one of her uh, papers. Education falls in the category of a formal process as opposed to knowledge. Regardless of these definitions, both knowledge and education tap into the mental states of a person, not anything else. Now, there's also this claim, and there's a huge debate in the literature on the process of education being completely detached from the process of schooling, and that schools should be replaced in favor of more efficient educational processes. I'm in favor of that as well. Now, coming back to the statement that I made earlier, uh, that the journey from data to information is way more critical than realized, is because there is a huge difference between facts evidence and opinions. Opinions are not facts. Opinions can be well-informed and well-researched, but they are in no way a fact. With the widespread reach uh, of data, opinions is what is easily available, but to get to a fact, there has to be some work. There is a work that needs to be done. Facts will always be unbiased, whereas opinion will always carry that element of bias in them, which pretty much divides communities, leave alone uniting them. Within today's education system, skills that are inclusive need to be stressed upon. Our education system should teach us to be free. I'm not the only one saying that. It's been said many, many times before and you know, for years, but I don't really understand or I mean, Perhaps the system that I come from, I was not taught to be free. I didn't know what freedom really meant because I was put through a very linear lens of working for grades, working for job, and pretty much never got that psychological, never got that psychological safe environment. Now, your freedom power is in you, not outside of you. Now, we have heard this sentence repeatedly in way too many different nicer versions, but the idea is the same. You are you, and that is your power. It is good to be able to stand on the shoulders of historical evidences and understand the reasonings, but equal weight should be given to free thinkers, out-of-box thinkers. Having said that, though, uh, some countries and within the corporate social responsibilities of organizations, there are schemes that encourage individuals to think out of the box and to apply their knowledge. But the reach of such projects is still very restricted and limited. Now, one potential reason for this lack is the lack of access to these resources and opportunities. Um, I spent a substantial amount of time back home in India early this year, and I have seen the lack of resources to an extent that the lack of proper infrastructures for economically backward classes, drugs and other substances are far more easily available to them than books. Now, as I mentioned, when I was growing up, I never got a psychologically safe environment, especially within the educational um, framework or schools. Uh, 
because it was a linear progression. You had to work for a degree, you had to work. You never really understand what does it mean? Like you, you have to be like somebody else. You have somebody like a model, a template to follow, um, which I feel I never followed though. But anyway, I feel that's, that's not really the right way of putting education to putting a, a, an individual through educational institution should be. So I strongly feel and from a personal experience that a psychologically safe and a holistic environment for every individual to be able to express, learn and grow is what every educational institution in this world uh, should really work on. The need for psychological safety is of utmost importance because the age is about information, awareness, and energy. I'm very sure we are all able to sense and feel the rise in our collective consciousness. So we are becoming more and more aware as the, day is, as the days go by. We are witnesses to tiny, to massive shifts from structures into fluidity. There was a time when gender was just males or females. And today, look at the uh, entire spectrum, the fluidity, even when coming to choosing your own gender. Individuals are free to identify themselves the way they want, the way they like. Each and every expression is being counted, and each and every one is being heard. I feel we are at the time where we have to choose. We really have to choose. Do we choose to see humans as essentially spiritual beings, or do we conceive ourselves as pattern of information of a highly complex order, something like a complex biocomputer? Ray Kurzweil, one of the world's leading voices in the transhuman movement, says that singularity is the moment when the universe wakes up. This notion of waking up also figures prominently in spiritual teachings and in esoteric teachings. However, in the ancient um, schools, it's always said that the universe is always awake. It is the humanity that is asleep. On hearing and reading Ray, one may wonder what kind of waking up would be involved in merging of the human consciousness with the super fast digital information processing machines. Would we really be able to maintain consciousness at all if such a fusion was realized or would we fall into a state of utter chaos? Now, while you think about that, I'm going to share a parting, parting words of H.P. Uh, Blavatsky with you. Whatever plane our consciousness may be acting in, both we and the things belonging to that plane are, for the time being, our only realities. As we rise in the scale of development, we perceive that during the stages through which we have passed, we mistook shadows for realities. And the upward progress of the ego is a series of progressive awakenings, each advance bringing with it the idea that now at last we have reached reality, but only when we shall have reached the absolute consciousness and blended our own with it, shall we be free from the delusions produced by Maya or illusion. Now, just before I conclude, let me talk about service. What does it mean to serve in this rich tech environment? I'll repeat what came out of a discussion between McLaren and Jandrick. A new revolutionary consciousness is being born that seeks to use technology in the service of humanity to fight disease, to feed the poor, to eliminate poverty, to save the biosphere, to reclaim dignity for all of us. If you can silence your mind for a moment, take your eyes off your computer screen and turn off your cell phone, you will hear it. In the darkness of an eclipsed moon, in the unfamiliar air of things to come, you will hear the gasp of a new humanity. Let us not dull our senses so much by extending them electronically such that we do not hear it. Let us listen with our imagination, remembering always that thought is spirit. Now, just to conclude, technology isn't bad or harmful, but how we use it needs to be guided by our own inner selves. Becoming a cyborg is very easy today. It's going to get much more easier as we progress in time, but it's surely a choice for all of us if we are to become one with the nature just by artificial interventions? Or should we do it 
or should we not do it? And should we just stick to the methods that we are quite familiar with, like meditation and yoga? Education environments, educational environments are changing due to technology, but we still need to have a psychologically safe environment to nurture the young minds, to give them a clear perspective on looking inside rather than anywhere else, because that feels like the need of the hour. Lastly, and I hope and wish that all these billions of dollars of investments into human augmentation doesn't come back to tell us what we already know, that we are all spiritual beings having human experiences. And with that, I would like to thank Rekha Nahar for inviting me to share my thoughts today. And I would like to congratulate the TUS for the amazing work that they do. And I have a list of references uh, just, you know, because I didn't make those things up. So they are there for anybody who wishes to uh, engage in this kind of a literature or have a read through. And thank you, everyone. I told you I'll be really short. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taposri. I was um, I was almost trying to listen to each of your words that you said. It's kind of um, mind boggling in some way. And I was keeping on thinking, particularly from TOS, we are into service work and also we are into education. How to balance these things? Yes, as you say towards the last part, technology is not bad. We know that because of technology, we are here. Across that, you are almost the uh, other side of the world and we are here together. But as you said, how we use the technology, that has been really our challenge in the school setting. So we have several teachers here and educators here. Maybe they would have some more clarifications. And I think we got some students also here. Uh, so let's open it. You may open the question and answer part. You may write on the chat box or you raise your hand and ask uh, directly to Taposhri. Those who came in late, Maybe some of you came in late. Taposhri is now in the other side of the world, almost in other side of the world. She is in London, but she had joined us uh, for this talk tonight. Okay, so we open. Anyone, you just unmute yourself or write on the chat box. Uh, may I begin, Sister Rekha? Yes, Brother Charlie. Yes, I've always been fascinated with these topics mentioned by Taposhri, and I I really appreciate uh, that she tries to bring down this com complex and complicated topic. Uh, so I extend my appreciation to Taposhri. And in her conclusion, I also agree with her that uh, technology is a tool, it's neutral, it always depends on whose hands it falls. Now she mentioned something about all of these uh, augmentations so much so that we might become deities, so to speak. And uh, it came to my mind about uh, these uh, practitioners who try to force and double with their chakras and kundalini without going through the purification process. So I was thinking about all of these augmentation tools that might enhance ourselves up to the point that we may find ourselves as uh, so-called deities. And uh, we know uh, the detrimental effect of those who dabble without that uh, process of purification. So I was trying to equate that uh, warning among theosophists with this situation of people dabbling with all of these augmentation, trying to uh, reach for the stars without uh, the so-called purification stage, which might uh, be the ruination of humanity. So that was just uh, those thoughts. And last point, I'm sorry, I'm uh, hugging the uh, uh, 
forum. But uh, just a last point, and I wish to hear Takoshi's uh, thoughts on this. She mentioned about uh, the e efficient education processes. So under that uh, model, how would we see the schools of the future, the curricula involved in this uh, efficient uh, models of uh, education processes? Thank you. Thank you. Those were very beautiful uh, questions and uh, I would love to respond to the first one where people are generally just like, the, the, the idea is that it's going to be a shop, you can just go and pick whatever enhancement tool you want and just use it. And without knowing, like you said very rightly, without going through the process of purification, you just pick and choose and you end up enter and become in a get into a state of delusion and that's a high there's a high risk that you will end up in that in that state now the idea is this is not for everybody this is what everybody needs to understand that this amalgamation of becoming a cyborg it's uh, and also one this is not for everybody but also when you engage and uh, you become or you have those artificial augmentations, you are coming back to the exact same realizations of that of a human being. You are coming back to realize how you are one with the nature, how the universe, you are part of the universe. So the bigger question is, why do I need all the augmentation just to you know, come back in a full circle? So it seems like it's, it's a question that people need to ask. It's not that by, and does that make you feel better? For example, like if I want to change the way I look, yes, I can change the way I look today, but will I be again going back to change how I look today as well, you know, like tomorrow? How, how does, because there's no stopping to it. There's no end, like as Blavatsky has even said in, said in Theosophy, that we will never be able to reach the absolute with the capital A, that is like the unmanifested part. We are all going through little, little tiny manifestations. And if we want to do that, if we have plenty of money, as I said, with billions of dollars, definitely go and experiment. But these experiences are not going to add you or make you more human. Do they make you more human? It doesn't. It just gives you that feeling of it's a very ego ego driven trip of making you feel really good about yourself as opposed to somebody else. Uh, so that is that, I'm, that. That's my thought on that. For efficient education, I strongly feel that the as much as from the from the educational system that I come from from India, it was always that the teachers knows the best. You know, they know the best, and you are you you are a student. You have come here. You will study. Now, I feel with with such an opening up of the space, I feel the teachers also need to learn with the students. Uh, there has to be a holistic learning for the teachers and for the students and that kind of and without with a psychological safety, just as a teacher would not feel offended by a student asking them a question that the teacher doesn't know the answer of you know, to be able to say, yeah, I don't know, I'm going to go and read. It's not a matter of shame. It doesn't put you down. And that amount of like that acceptance of trust of belief to grow together. Uh, by the use of technology, with the online classes, with the help of Zoom, with the help of creating the safe environment where you feel we are here for each other, you know, that is, that is what is going to help education and to be able to feel more free because education is not not i mean it is in a way a means to a career but sometimes you just want to study because you want to know you and the more you get to knowing you you are going to become more free you don't need anybody else's approval of existing on this planet uh, you give that to yourself and how do you give that to yourself with the collective environment of support with compassion with listening and less ego. I'm pretty sure ego is going to be there always, but with less ego when you come into that environment to share. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. I found myself writing down notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, actually me too, Brother Charlie. I also found myself taking notes that seldom <laughs> happens. <laughs> so much to think about, uh, Tapasri. Okay, anyone else uh, like to ask anything or share any thoughts? You can unmute yourself.
while others are thinking, I like to read uh, a bit long message here, but beautiful message. It's from an educator, John. I don't know if he's in the link or watching from Facebook. He says, uh, I was amazed when Ms. Taposhri mentioned a technologist who was becoming a cyborg and yet shared that she never felt becoming part of a machine but more on becoming part of nature of the earth. That was amazing. And I think other people should hear this, especially those who fear human augmentations. Thank you, Taposhri. That is from John, an educator. Oh, thank you. Then here thank is uh, from Dr. Uh, Angeli Santa Teresa says, thanks much for sharing Taps. Okay, Brother David also is saying thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just feel like augmentation is not, if you want to, uh, you know, you want to enhance the feeling, you want to feel it, experience. Experience of all kinds are going to be, it's good to have a huge, vast experience, but you also need to tap into what is it that's happening to your own inner self. And that is where the, because if you don't, it's like the outside is a reflection of what you're on the inside. And I might use different words to explain it, but it's being said by many, many people before me and everybody all on this call probably know it better than I do. And what are the changes that's happening to you inside of you when you have these enhancements and the tools? Do you see yourself becoming more and more addicted? Do you see yourself becoming more and more giving? What is it that's happening? And that is the power that we cannot uh, tap into unless we teach the youth of today that this is not something you need unless and until you are there. You know, you 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 need to make a decision to be able to make a decision for yourself. You need to have a holistic picture, which is you have people you can trust. You have teachers who will learn with you. You have your support of a society, a community, which is going to grow together. That sense of belonging has to come from within. And then you can use augmentation for fun, I think. I mean, I won't do it, but I'm just saying if you want to. <laughs> uh, okay, here is uh, another message from another educator. She's saying, Carmen is saying, your talk may be short, but very enlightening and helpful in understanding how technology should be used in our times now. Thank you, she says. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to share. Okay, I'm <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank Tops. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. It was very well presented and very well researched. <laughs> I was amazed thank by you. every part. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm having difficulty with my internet right now. And <laughs> it 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 makes me feel, oh, I should hear that part. <laughs> <laughs> so I am very thankful. And I um, truly agree that not only in technology or in human augmentation, but when uh, when human beings or when, uh, when we encounter new things that um, is presented to us, the, the first reaction is to avoid or to not try at the moment or to look away. For example, the technologies. I, I am an educator and I'm really fond of doing the face-to-face -face kind of um, teaching the students and being with them and facilitating the class. So I, uh, during the face-to-face -face time or the pre-pandemic time, I am really um, not into using technology inside the classroom. But then pandemic hits, so we don't have a choice but to, but to really learn technology. And what... Um, what changes during the process of learning is that it is really in, in the hands of those who are using it. Whatever it is, not only technology, um, it will really help you. For example, in my case, I am, I am actually not into technology, but I learned a lot during this time, this one and a half year. And I've, um, I've had a lot of opportunity um, to to also share what I have. At the same time, I got a lot of information that I could share to the students as well. So it is true that I am also learning with them during the process mm -hmm. of learning what is it 
here in in this technology so it is very uh, a, a wonderful experience to to have this and uh, my real my realization in in this process is that um before deciding that it will not be appropriate for us or it will not be necessary or these things might be not helpful for us maybe we should pause really learn what is it in there and try to experience if it clicks then it's good if it's not then stop <laughs> mm-hmm. so that's my realization thank you tops for sharing and for everyone thank you are. no thank you for sharing because that's that's precisely what it is not everybody would want to feel what say uh, moon ribas feels right she feels the earthquakes across the globe and she dances to the to that to the beats of that now not everybody would want to feel it now if you want and for her to feel it and then to realize that she's a part of the nature she's a, the universe is she's a part of the universe and she's not here alone is an amazing realization feeling close to humanity but she would not have felt it if she didn't do what she you know the with the implants that she has similarly with neil to be able to understand and draw with colors he would not have been able to do it if he didn't get that antenna So today for them to come back and step up and say we don't feel like machines we are we feel more like humans is a big big takeaway for people who are able to function cognitively you know in a, in a good space because then it becomes do you need to enhance your cognitive abilities by these augmentation do you really need it and the answer to i think a majority of that will be no we we can really work on ourselves through our own channeling our own inner strength that we all are blessed with um so the question is you know which part of the world you know and which part of the world and in which kind of segment of humanity or the section of you know population do you sit in do you sit it where you feel that you need an artificial limb to and to experience that to feel normal please go ahead and do it by all means but do you just want to do it just because to feel a little superior than others don't do it you know so so that kind of a uh, separation needs to happen and with teachers like you with educators like you you need to be able to train the kids and the young minds to be able to make this distinction that not everything is not needed for everybody you have your own path to walk on but you don't need other people's approval to walk your path to the best of your to the best of your ability you know and that confidence is going to set them free and that is something that i wish my teachers had told me when i was studying <laughs> i never got that but i think with the new ways and new methods and bringing it back to what does it matter to you today how does it relate to you just studying some historical evidence piece of evidence you know what happened in 1850s or 1730s doesn't doesn't relate to me today how how has that impacted me today how is going to impact me tomorrow and that relation is what is the job of the teachers who are teaching them and they learn like you said you learn and then you bring that to the kids today and then see them take it forward and that is how we grow i feel Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tops. <laughs> Dr. Roseldo Val Santos says, remarkable talk. Uh, John, you want to say something? Yeah, Please, go ahead. I, I feel inspired by the talk of Mom oh, Kaposri. Yes. <laughs> I just realized right now that, yeah, I, 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 I like your view on, on education, Ms. Kaposri, and I'm realizing it right, right now, especially we have some students who are studying in IT, information technology, Um, I also believe that uh, since our technology is improving, we also need to invest energy in terms of education in, in a way that we are improving their consciousness or we are improving our consciousness. So we can also be ready with the improvement in terms of technology and we know how to use it. As you mentioned a while ago, uh, technology isn't bad. It just depends on, on the people. Or using the technology, or using the uh, the innovations, I also believe with you when you say that it is our our role is to teach the young people how to understand something inside of them, or teach inwardly, and not on the things outside. Because if we teach them things outside, like we we teach them how to use technology, how how things work, 
are just maybe producing machines or people yes. who will work on them, that. But if we try to start from within, from the inside, and these students, the students right now here listening, uh, if you were able to understand yourself and improve your under awareness, yes. uh, once you use a technology, you will be more, uh, you'll be more effective. You'll be yeah. dealing with real life problems, real life problems. Like uh, how do you, how do you address um, the misery of, uh, misery of life? How are you going to address uh, violence? How are you going to address, uh, I mean, how are you going to develop peace and happiness? So this is very powerful, Taposri. Thank you very much for your sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And like I also said, in, 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 in science, the scientific, the neuropsych you know, uh, neuropsychiatry and the neurobiology side of things, they say that the human brain reacts differently when you experience awe, when you experience compassion, when you experience kindness, than it reacts to when you look at something very morally, because that is where you're giving a judgment. You're going to be judged based on you know your understanding your thoughts your opinions and and that is a very critical environment to be in should we all not be very kind and just experience that happiness i think we all should and that's what i think the teachers should take back that it's it's not about how many followers you have on you know on your social media it is about what are what is that that one post how is that making a change to your inner self how is it affecting you? Is that making you feel better? Do it. Is that making you more aware of the surrounding? Please engage in it. But if that is making you more selfish and if that is making you more like, oh, I just, I am just the best and everybody else is just not there yet, then there is a problem. And that distinction, I think the kids of today, because they are in that age of information, they need to be able to make it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. There is another comment from Priya Gopal. I think she's not here in the Philippines. I don't know which country she is. She said it was a remarkable talk, Dr. Ganguly. She's talking about you, Taposri. A lot to reflect upon and logically connect to what resonates with self. That's true. Yeah. The self is all we need to understand and spend time on. It's like I, I have this beautiful example. Someone said, you know, you can use a knife to kill someone and you can also use a knife to prepare a very good meal. So it depends on who's using it and how are you using it? And what is it that you're trained in using it? Like who's trained you to use it for what? And that always has an impact. Teachers, educators of the society, they are, I think, a very crucial and important part, building blocks of the society and the communities at large. So when they learn along with the changes and the context, I think the whole society learns. Um, and we stress less upon the billion dollar investments on just trying to make things artificially good because that doesn't end up anywhere. Yeah. We have another educator here, Baby, Baby Jane Dignos is saying, I think human augmentation is good, but we should remember or keep in mind that despite of those modifications, we are still human being with a greater purpose in life. Yeah. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. Christopher C. from Medical Profession saying, Thank you, Taps. Need to drop for another call. Very enlightening talk. Thank you, Christopher. Then baby saying again, yeah, I agree with you, Joan. She has the GLC philosophy in, of education. They're talking about you, that <laughs> you are almost talking about the GLC. GLC is the Golden Link Golden College. Link College. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't know what the philosophy is, but this is what feels right to me. So I'm glad it's, it's linked somehow. <laughs> the Theosophical Order of Service founded, established this Golden Link mm -hmm. College. And uh, we have now three campuses and it has been, although actually that was one of my question in a way or sharing I wanted to talk when you talked about from structures into fluidity. And I was thinking about our three campuses, actually four we have that sometime we wish to, although we have, we have added some new elements which they are talking about GLC educational philosophy, but still we are somewhat 
um, not somewhat we are somewhat is yes, limited to to implement the the government given curriculum and all those things and i totally uh, could reconnect all the was long time ago you when you said that we come from the culture bangladesh india where teachers know everything and they know everything in that sense but here in the philippines at least in golden link college these students have freedom actually and they can they can move freely and they can think freely they can even question the teachers here is i think a student uh, christian mexica uh, says hello everyone yeah i am a student from golden link college i'm just going to give an insight from what miss baby jane uh, that i agree that human augmentation is good because if this innovation were doing things more easier, faster and better than before. And I also agree that we should keep in our mind that we are humans that have a greater purpose in life. We will always be more better than technology because those cyborgs that we're going to produce are being programmed by humans mind. I hope I read it all correctly. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, for these uh, insights. Yeah, it's a fascinating divide. We have humans, we have uh, cyborgs, we have transhumans. So in a way, we have kind of very successfully divided humans. Uh, so that's that's nice. And it's very nice to see how the awareness shifts. And the, the thing with the cyborgs like Moon, which I already showed on the slide, coming back to say that I, I feel more human. It's like you go all the way just to come back. And what's the point of going that way when you have to come back to, to understanding the basic universal principles that we all live with? But that's just how I feel about it. I'm way too critical about technology. I mean, I love it, but uh, I mean, I have my own... Uh, apprehensions of uh, augmentation, which I feel uh, is not required. But then again, with the prosthetics and with the medical field, I feel if some people like Neil, for example, had to, so that that's that's something I support, I like that. Uh, but again, I feel it's, uh, it's quite a struggle. And I feel the teachers really need to step up in the education field to be able to, you know, hold the society together. It's falling on you guys, not me. <laughs> But yeah, is the educators play really very important role? One thing we have one more comment. But before that, I like to uh, I like to hear something from you, uh, Taposhri, about this point. Is the mental health uh, during, especially during this pandemic, it has become a kind of favorite term, uh, mental health. Sometimes it is used or overused a term. Sometimes it looks like. How do you see that? technology is helping or is it helping reduce or helping increase this mental health problem? Any it's, idea? It's complete. Yeah, it's completely divided by the population. So there is a population to who it has impacted negatively and there is a population to which it has really been a kind of a blessing, uh, you know, the technology. And it brings back, it takes you back into understanding where is it that you are starting from? What is your starting position? Are you starting off as somebody who's always relying on technology to get it to, for an outward validation? Then it is impacting you negatively because you're not getting it anymore. And are you somebody who's just using technology just as much as you would like to use to just get from point A to point B? It is definitely something that is helping you because you're now well connected to, you know, a lot of people online. You have all these online support forums, online groups. You will have practitioners who are kind of, who can be, you know, there for you all the time. You can tap into them. So it is actually not so much about the technology. It is about who is using it. And uh, for mental health conditions, mental health, especially depression, it was quoted back in 2008 that the World Health Organization sent in, presented a report in 2008 that depression is going to be a leading uh, mental health problem by the year 2020 and beyond, and which is what we have seen. And if you tap into this uh, and the recent re reports of the teenagers um, using Instagram and Facebook and feeling really bad about their body, feeling bad about how they look, who they are, and that is causing a lot of anxiety because everybody's looking everywhere. It's like a whole age of information 
generation out there, you're constantly in this comparison paradigm, looking around. Nobody comes and tells you, look inside. It's okay, you don't have to look around. Wear the blinkers. This is the time you need to wear the blinkers and just be able to choose what applies to you. Not everything is going to be applicable to you because you are, like I said, you are you and that is your unique uh, you know, strength. No two people look exactly similar. They can look similar, but they're not similar. Now, why? Why is somebody's genetic condition? And this is a great study on the twins because their genetics stay the same. They're in, you know, and the environment sometimes stay the same, sometimes stay, you know, become different. Now, what happens when even with the same genes, you can find one twin depressed and the other one not? So what happened along the way? It's not, it's not really the gene. It is something that is very unique about you. And what is that power? And so, so it is, again, coming back to your point, it is about who is using. There is a rise in mental health, which we cannot deny. And a lot of it has to be the, the technology is kind of uh, held responsible for it. And the reports say that it is, especially with all these uh, forums like Instagram, which is very look focused, very focused on uh, you know, the artificial uh, and the transient way of a human being. Um, but uh, how many techers are there to actually li literally look inside of a human being? There are very few. Uh, but I feel that is where uh, everybody needs to sort of turn the attention to, to bring the society back. And I have a very strong feeling. I feel we can do it. I feel we are really well connected now to be able to make that difference. And that is something I see as a very, very strong point of technology. So mental health, again, back to answering your questions. I know I go all over the place, uh, but mental health, I think the rise and as well as a blessing and a curse, it is down to the human being who is, you know, suffering uh, from it. It's, it's, I mean, for some, it is really a blessing to get that help, to be able to be connected. For some, it is really like, putting them deeper, like they say, they make the sick more, you know, sicker. So that's how it's, that's how I view it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more uh, comment here, sharing from a student also of Golden Link College. Good evening, everyone. It's John Lee Trinidad. I am also a student from Golden Link College. It's really that technology is not totally dangerous It because how you use it. So many people nowadays, they are disappointed or disagree uh, in improving our life because of technology. Yeah, second is how we use it. That is the main thing. Or are we ready to use it? Ready, we may know the skill, but in terms of our, uh, as a spiritual being, are we ready to use it? Okay. And there's also yeah. another point that I want to make very quickly. It is yeah. about this, this whole rage of followers. You know, we live in an age where, you know, you go, you give, you give a talk or you post a picture or you have something to say and you have millions of people following the celebrity culture, you know, like millions of people following the celebrity. And then, and maybe when you dig deeper into the content of it, the content is very superficial. It has got no impact on you internally, but you will have millions of takers for that. At the same time, you put something out which is more meaningful, you will have only five or 10 people, you know, hardly kind of, you know, interacting with that. Now, never let that stop you from telling your true story, because those numbers that those algorithms that are written behind all these, you know, way that the, the, the network works, that uh, the platform works, they don't determine the worth and the value. And this is what I said with the fact and evidence and opinions that, you know, never take a look take a pause take a breather and see is that a, just an opinion or is that a fact and you would see that facts has very less takers than opinions Sens sensationalization has got more takers in the world today um, than something which is you know quite unbiased and true and i think we should all work for that truth and that's a bigger work that needs to be done Okay, we still have a few more minutes. Anyone would like to <clears throat> unmute and, and uh, share? I'd like to okay, brother to the thought of uh, Taps. Uh, she mentioned that, uh, well, uh, she was presenting the situation of humans being augmented by technology and machines, but uh, maybe Taps could help us 
is it possible to envision machines being augmented by maybe a brain cell or a brain what do you think yeah so it's like so uh, that's a that's a very interesting question so it is pretty much there is a big work around nanotechnology which is still not there in the mass market but people are working towards it and cryonics for example you know huge billions and billions of dollars of investments has, has gone into it in America. And the idea is that we are actually going to bring in that human element, the neural correlates of the human brain, which we think now the scientists who are working on it have a very typical line of thought. They feel that the brain is a composition of liquids. It's kind of fluids and some sort of chemicals and some, you know, components that work based on how those chemicals interact. So if we drain out the chemicals and we use the nanotechnology, then we will be able to recreate the human being, right? It's going to be the machine recreated with that element of human in it. Because that element of human, they are defining it not by the thoughts, uh, but by the chemicals that exist within the human body. Now, they don't have a proof of it because we are not there yet with the technology. But on the other side of this side of the world that we are in, we don't have a proof to tell them that not a scientific proof to say that we are not all chemical reactions. You know, according to them, it's chemical reactions in context and you get a human being. That is what the aim is to put, put onto the machines to make them more, you know, human. And which is why all these ethical considerations and a strong push for to drive the moral and ethical codes of robots and all the uh, machines have, have a bigger role to play now. And the technology companies are being put through a stronger ethical um, grind because they want to know because if this happens it will be it will be machines who will be exactly like you like humans and we are not that far off actually but then the thing is like how do you keep training them so obviously you will have to train them to be able to as we understand it today you will have to train them with a set of thoughts with a set of emotions you know to be able to react in a certain way at a given certain in a certain situation but the, there is a there's an investment in this field as we speak uh, but we have not achieved we have not seen a full model people are skeptical scientists are skeptical some say that it will be achieved, some say it won't be achieved. The world is divided on that. But there is a push and a lot of work that's going on to achieve this. It's scary, sounds scary yes. to me, but <laughs> but we might just see it in 20 years time. We'll be there. Yes, I think it would be sooner than later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I hope you don't mind I because uh, I keep on sharing this with my classes, and uh, I teach uh, law, the, the law on persons, as well as the law on property. And uh, there have been developments in cloning and all of those things. And uh, oh, we, we have those laws on person about uh, marriage, obligations, legal personality of persons. But on the other hand, property may be disposed of, may be used and abused. And uh, we've been discussing in my classes about uh, these inroads into cloning under the assumption, if we can create human beings in the laboratory and we consider this property, uh, you, you can just imagine uh, almost perfect human beings, or maybe not perfect, but maybe in the normal sense of the world, word, we refer to them as special children, but imperfect creations in the laboratory. And because they are imperfect, we just throw them out in the dumpster. But these are practically human beings, clones. So, uh that, that's uh where the discussion is taking us in my subjects yeah. do we consider them as persons human beings or just our property disposable at any time hmm. 
it's a bigger question and i think i think yeah with with uh, with your class and with the science backing this up because cloning is kind of is achievable it, it is there it is happening as we speak and uh, you know and the bigger problem that theosophists come around is like you know what happens in the astral plane you know how how does that work and right. and the and and the question is like well now you have two bodies to work with which is good <laughs> so so you know rather than one body you've got two bodies and there are all these theories around Around. but this is this is becoming this is a is for us it is like something that is there it's going to come into our faces very very soon more soon than you know we can imagine and how do we tackle it so are we really going to say that well this is not this is just a property and we're just going to dismantle it when it's not working now who takes that call and how ethical is this so i think i think there's a huge amount of and the ethics is kind of held on like it's it's kind of held off right now because of the uh, advancements in technology but with nanotechnology coming into a full swing and you know coming into the practice i think this is going to be a bigger debate as to what do we do with this um are we really that, that's again where i said the, the the division of humanity we have humans we'll have cyborgs some parts of humans some part of machines we'll have transhumans and then we will have the actual robots um so i think that is the spectrum of humanity and uh, rather than you know and and at what level does awareness move how does awareness move through this is it going to be fluid is it going to be restricted and what do they realize with cyborgs you can see that the awareness is the, the because they're half humans half machines it's still the human elements and the properties stay but what if you become a transhuman what if you completely are machine man made you know with that element what what's then i don't know it's fascinating but i don't know right yeah okay um there is one more comment here whose baby said again, this is such an amazing talk, thought provoking and something to think about or reflect. Thank you, Tafs. Thank you, okay. thank you. So before I uh, request Brother Charlie to say something closing word, Tafs, uh, Taposri, you like to say something uh, as your parting message to mostly our educators and students here. Yeah, I think you have a tough job, and but I believe you will actually, you know, uh, stand up to it and deliver your best. And I believe you hold the key into unlocking that potential that each and every student uh, has who comes to you. And in turn, I think the more you give, the more you're going to get. So you will learn with them, as some of you have already shared with me. And I, I see, you know, you creating those communities and building those bridges, which is what we need you for. So thank you for all the amazing work that you do. Brother Charlie. Yes. Uh, well, with this uh, fascinating presentation of TAPS, uh, it is indeed mind boggling. Uh, some of us would look at it as uh, science fiction, but there are other people or already doing it in their laboratories, in uh, their garages. You know? So uh, it, it's quite a, uh, an interesting future that we have. And thank you, Taps, because personally, I consider my Saturday evening today well spent. And I am sure the rest of our participants uh, share that sentiment. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Brother Charlie. Yeah, I felt the same way that it, this, it was a busy day for Brother Charlie and some of us with several online activities. But the ending has been really kind of soothing and although it's mind boggling, but at the same time, very well spent this evening. Thank you, Taposri. Thank uh, you, thank you Armelin, for inviting me. Say it again, Armelin, you like to say it? Yes, with this talk and you can hear from my voice. I'm also excited again to go back <laughs> with the students and explore things. We are actually exploring things in one of my classes. I am we are, I am allotting one day, one hour for them to talk about what they want to talk about so we can explore things together. So I'm excited for Monday. 
<laughs> thank you everyone Love. maybe we could I have a you. group picture before we end the meeting yeah <clears throat> Sige. okay Armelin. I will stop now the live <coughs>